This is part of a tutorial created for students studying in the Ocean and Naval Architectural Engineering Discipline at Memorial University of Newfoundland's Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. The tutorial covers the primary hydrostatic curves produced in concept design, why they are used, and their historical and current relevance, or not, in modern designs. We're going to review why these curves are essential and how they relate to one another, and I'm also going to introduce the methods by which these curves are produced manually. Once we've looked at some representative methods of manual curve production, I'll introduce some examples of how to perform these same types of operations using several of the most common naval architecture and drafting softwares in use today. The objective of today's lecture is to increase your understanding of the why and how behind the production of Bongine curves. By the end of today's lecture, you should be able to explain the origin and structure of Bongine curves, identify the necessary inputs to derive a set of Bongine curves, and be able to manually produce the Bongine curve for a primitive vessel. So let's begin the discussion today by taking a quick detour down one of the forgotten lanes of naval architectural history. In 1778, Antoine Nicolas Francois Bonjean is born in Paris, and after intensive study of engineering, he joins the French Corps of Maritime Engineering at age 20. In 1798, it's only been 22 years since America's Revolutionary War, and the French are neck deep in a bloody revolutionary war of their own. The famous British Admiral, Lord Horatio Nelson, is using his fleet to decimate the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile. To no one's surprise, Bonjean is dispatched to a frigate fighting the British in Egypt. Despite all the turmoil, war, and general chaos raining down upon continental Europe, we're also in a time of unprecedented industrial and scientific development, and the French are renowned for their extraordinarily elegant approach to shipbuilding taking a previously art-based discipline and applying a variety of scientific techniques to design and construction. Anyways, in 1801, Bonjean is posted back to France, where he bounces around a number of naval dockyards, gaining experience and learning the techniques of dynamic ship launch. Fastidiously applying his engineering education to his job as a naval constructor, he publishes a paper in 1808 entitled Nouvelles Echelles de Déplacement, roughly, New Displacement Scales which describes the method of drawing curves of the cross-sectional area of a ship as a function of its draft at a particular waterline. The ingenious novelty of the curves comes from its relatively easy method of application, its accuracy, and the fact that this information can then be transformed to provide a measure of the displacement of a hull as well as its local buoyancy at any region along its length. All in all, the Bongine curve creates a paradigm shift in how designers can visualize and calculate inputs for hydrostatics from a tabular or curve-based method, and Bonjean's name goes down in the Naval Architecture Hall of Fame. Bonjean dies 14 years later in 1822, and 198 years later, his method is still so ubiquitous that it's near impossible to survive the first year of study in the field without encountering him, although he's probably rolling in his grave somewhere given how we butcher his name in North America. But I digress. So, let's do a quick recap. Bongean curves can be used to calculate a volume of displacement, as well as the local, and as a consequence, the longitudinal center of buoyancy of a vessel. The curves are most often used in stability calculations. In fact, they are instrumental in traditional methods of damage stability and for launching calculations. The beauty of Bongean curves is that they can be used to predict these behaviors at any trim or water plane condition we impose on the vessel. Understanding Bongean curves is important because they represent a constituent of the common hydrostatic curves of form. With only a little practice, experienced naval architects and designers can intuit significant information about the appearance, dimensions, and attitude of a vessel as it sits at a waterline. Prior to the computing age, a set of good Bongean curves made many manual calculations far less laborious, and even today they can allow a designer to rapidly perform a number of gross checks to confirm their suspicions about a design. Even in designs produced today, a stipulation is still customarily included in the design package that a complete set of curves will be supplied with the lead ship of a build. Alright, now that we've covered the whys and what fors, let's get into the how. Any of you who have tuned in before may already know that when we're examining a topic for the first time, or revisiting it for the first time in a while, I like to work with basic or primitive geometry and values of known dimensions or formula. This is actually a good practice to carry with you. It allows you to ensure your method is correct while eliminating a source of error in the more complicated aspects of some of the calculations. And it allows you to very quickly apply the old Socratic method to critically examine your thinking and approach to a problem. Anyways, I'll do some more examples in a future video with increasingly more difficult geometry requiring integration techniques. But for now, 
consider the wall-sided barge on screen. The barge has the dimensions shown, a beam of 10 meters, a length of 100 meters, and a molded draft of 10 meters. Just by inspection, we can identify that the cross-sectional area is uniform throughout the vessel's length, with each cross-section having a maximum area of 100 square meters and the ship having an overall volume of 10,000 cubic meters. Based on the definition of a Bongine curve, we can already surmise something important here. The Bongine curve should look the same at any location across the length of this hull form. Let's examine that conclusion a little more closely. We'll begin by dividing the ship up into sections over its entire length by adding a series of transverse stations. A common practice is to use 21 stations, but there's no set rule. In case you've forgotten, stations are normally assigned from the forward perpendicular through to the aft perpendicular, with station 0 set at the forward perpendicular. Here I've used 11 stations, so we effectively have 10 units or blocks of ship with a span of 10 meters each. Next, we create a number of water planes. When it's possible, the easiest way to begin is usually to assume the vessel sits level so that the planes intersect the vessel parallel to the keel or baseline. Set your first water plane at the keel and create a number of water planes. They don't have to be equally spaced, and it may make sense to have smaller spans in regions of high curvature or larger spans in a wall-sided region. But don't overcomplicate things if you don't have to. Here, I've created 11 water planes spanning from the keel to the bulkhead deck of the barge. Now, take a look at the screen. The hatched region in white is an area of station zero. That area is defined by boundaries created by water plane zero, water plane one, the ship's center line, and the hull of the barge. Let's project it to two dimensions so we can visualize it a little differently. Starting at station zero, we need to calculate the underwater area that would exist at each draft or water line at a station, and then repeat the process for every station along the length of the vessel. Mathematically, we are calculating the area at each station as a function of the draft at that station. Given that many ships are symmetric about their center line, a common way to do this is to divide the ship down its center line, calculate the areas of these half breadths, and then simply double the values to get the total underwater area at each station at a given water line. In this case, we'll begin at station zero and first calculate the area enclosed by the plane at the keel and the plane directly above it. We know that the barge has a beam of 10 meters, so its half breadth is 5 meters. Similarly, we can take the number of water lines and divide it into the depth of the barge to arrive at a spacing of 1 meter. Now, given that our vessel is perfectly wall sided and we've cut it with a series of horizontal planes, we can clearly see that each area at every water line can be calculated as the area of a rectangle, where the base is the half breadth of the barge and the height is the draft at each water line. So, beginning with an area of 0 square meters at waterline 0 and terminating at 45 square meters at waterline 9, we can tabulate our underwater area at each waterline for station 0. Now take a look at the table I've created for station 0. There's a couple of important points to note. First, our initial waterline, waterline 0, is at the keel. So at the ship's baseline there is no cross-sectional area immersed. And subsequently, the area we record is 0 square meters. Second, note in the table that I've remembered to double all of my calculated areas to reflect the fact that there is another half of a ship to account for. Finally, take a look at waterline 10. In the model, we can see that the water lines, our green planes, stopped at a draft of 9 meters. Thus, in the operating condition we're considering, any structure above that will not be immersed. If the structure is not immersed, there cannot be an additional underwater cross section associated with it. So as we continue to progress up the side of the ship, the total immersed cross-sectional area no longer changes with respect to the vessel's draft. Now, normally we would repeat this process for each station along the ship's length. Given the consistent cross-sectional area for the barge, we can surmise that the values calculated for station zero will be the same resultants at every other station on our barge, so this step is unnecessary in this case. Now I know what you're thinking. This video is supposed to be about Bongine curves, and I have yet to commit a single curve to paper. So now that we have all these areas tabulated, what do we do with them? We begin by taking a profile view of the ship, including its stations, and we superimpose the water lines on it. Then, somewhere on the drawing, we assign a scale that spans an interval that contains the range from 0 square meters through to our largest cross-sectional area. Now, at every station, we can plot the cross-sectional area at each water line for that station. Beginning at the baseline, or water plane 0, we place a point on the intersection of the water plane with the station. This effectively creates a coordinate system using the baseline plane and the station as your axes. Then, we place another point on water plane 1. 
the horizontal coordinate for this value is oriented by taking the area value you calculated for that water plane, finding an appropriate drawing distance using the scale you assigned in your drawing, and placing the point at that distance forward from the station. For example, in this case, the point on water plane 1 is located at the distance on my scale that represents 5 square meters of cross-sectional area. You can see from examining the curves that we can rapidly identify the cross-sectional area at any draft along the ship's length. Okay, so that was somewhat of a fast and furious overview of the first of our hydrostatic curves, the Bonjean curve. Today we discussed who Antoine Nicolas Francois Bonjean was, what he contributed to the world of naval architecture, and why it matters. We also looked at what a set of Bonjean curves are used for and how they are manually produced. In the next video, I'm going to work through some examples of calculating more complex geometries before we get into how to save some time and effort by producing Bonjean curves using software. On your own, I'd like you to consider the two vessel shapes on screen. What do you think their Bonjean curves would look like? Try drawing the generalized shape each geometry would produce. Developing the sense of intuition for vessel geometry can be really frustrating for some people and it takes practice, but I promise it's a valuable skill worth building to give you the ability to critically assess the fairness of a design, as well as for benchmarking if there's an error in your more precise mathematical treatment of a set of curves. If you want to know just how good your intuition was, go ahead and assign the same principal dimensions I used in the video and try creating your own set of curves. I mean, or tune into the next video where I'll be discussing it in some detail. As always, thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or feedback, please leave them in the comments below and one of our admins will get back to you. If you like what you're learning here, please hit the like button or go ahead and subscribe. We try to publish content to enhance the skills and knowledge you need to have, so it's always nice to know if someone out there is getting the message.